it's come to our attention that, that some 44% of the participants today <clears throat> have never been to a BMAF conference. And so we thought it would be reasonable to discuss a few matters to why we believe that Mesoamerica is the land of the Book of Mormon. Now we do know that in the Book of Helaman and elsewhere that there were great numbers of people who left the land of Zarahemla and went into the north countries and way up possibly into the United States. And we have no quarrel with that. But once uh, they leave the purview of the writers of the Book of Mormon, then they're lost to the, to the knowledge of those Book of Mormon record keepers. <clears throat> Let me remind you what President Hinckley said. The evidence for its truth, for its validity in a world that is prone to demand evidence lies not in archaeology or anthropology, though these may be helpful to know. It, it lies not in word research or historical analysis, though these may be confirmatory. So President Hinckley is not saying we shouldn't study the Book of Mormon with the idea of evaluating external evidences. The evidence for its truth and validity lies within the covers of the book itself. The test of its truth lies in the reading of it. Is it a book of God? And then he closes to the continuing of the Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ. And so we have to keep this uppermost in our minds that these things that we talk about in terms of confirmatory information do not convert us to the Book of Mormon. We already have to have our testimonies through the Holy Ghost. There are several criteria for the Book of Mormon. A high civilization with kings and priests and city-states. An agricultural base to support several millions of people. And there, of course, the, you can see there are numerous references to each one of these. A highly literate society, a written language with scribes as important officers. A functional calendar and dating system. A merchant class using weights and measures. Engineers to build temples, towers, highways using cement. Highly skilled craftsmen, precious metals and stonework being used. A warrior society with great battles, structured armies, and sophisticated fortifications. Marriage alliances. We don't think of marriage alliances, but uh, when Ammon goes down, he is treated as if he is some sort of royalty by King Lamoni. Legends of a white bearded god. And all of the above criteria in a place marked by a narrow neck of land and a major river flowing south to north. There are some people who say that one of the definitions of the head of a river is this. I'm not sure you can read it in this darkness. This comes directly from the 1828 edition of the Noah Webster Dictionary, in which the proponents of the Mississippi River say that the head of the river is a confluence. In other words, where the Ohio River runs into the Mississippi River. As a, this, was, this is definition number 23. The definition number 18 is the source or the headwaters of a river. Just as we know now and understand the head of a river to be the source, not the, not the confluence. In fact, this 23 definition was obsolete even in 1828. In fact, it was never used except by Shakespeare and Edmund Spencer and some of their writings. Not only where in the Western Hemisphere could these criteria be found, but where Joseph Smith could not possibly have known about them 
1828. In 1841, Joseph Smith was presented with copies. This is a modern version of the travels of John Lloyd Stevens in Central America and Yucatan. But Joseph Smith and the early brethren were so taken by Stevens' treatment of the cities of Palenque and Quirigua and so forth down in Central America, that is to say southern Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, that they quoted some of John Lloyd Stevens' material in the Times and Seasons. This is an actual copy of the Times and Seasons. Of course, I know you can't read it, but these are the two pages that uh, discuss it. And so what he says Joseph Smith in Times and Seasons, the foregoing extract has been made to assist the Latter-day Saints in establishing the Book of Mormon as a revelation from God. You see, at this time, he's even trying to show by external evidences that the Book of Mormon was true. It affords great joy to have the world assist us to so much proof that even the most credulous cannot doubt. Let us turn our subject, however, in the Book of Mormon, where these wonderful ruins of Palenque are among the mighty works of the Nephites. This is Joseph Smith's statement indicating that he believed that the Central America were the lands of the Book of Mormon. The city of Zarahemla burned at the crucifixion of the Savior and rebuilt afterwards stood upon this land. The ruins of Zarahemla have been found where the Nephites left them. We are not going to declare positively that the ruins of Kirigua are those of Zarahemla, but when the land and the studies and the stories and the books and so forth, and then he goes on and explains a little bit more. It will not be, it will not be a bad plan to compare Mr. Stevens' ruined cities with those in the Book of Mormon. Many of you have probably uh, drawn your own internal map of what the Book of Mormon appears to say uh, f from the pages of the Book of Mormon. It talks about the, the, the greater land of Zarahemla, over, over which they had chief judges and so forth. The land of Bountiful is mentioned. And in the most recent edition of the Book of Mormon, the one that we use now, there is a space that's called the land between the land of Zerham and the land of Bountiful. That's missing in the previous cop editions of the Book of Mormon. It was originally in the 1830 edition, but uh, has been dropped out and was only replaced in 1981. There's a narrow strip of wilderness that is mentioned. The land northward land of Nephi, where the Lamanites lived. Mentioned also is a section of country that's called, well, it's an area where the Nephites could walk across it in a day and a half. Now, you remember that, uh, that little area. It, it says this particular location was from the West Sea to the East. It does not say the East Sea says the east. And you read further, especially in the book of Alma, that this was a fortification area from, uh, from the area of the Pacific or the western coast up to some point where they didn't need to have fortifications any further. The river Sidon is also mentioned, but does it ever mention where it empties out into the sea? to the West Sea or to the East Sea, doesn't mention. And so when I drew this map, you know, I drew it because we didn't know where it went. We now know, of course, I had to go and empty into the East Sea. <clears throat> the Book of Mormon territory is really not very large either. Going from Nephi down to Zarahemla, it was done by Alma and his group as well as 
some of the other settlers who, who left the land of Nephi under Gideon and uh, King Limhi, we find that the dimension is only about 210 days. Uh, two, if excuse me, it was about 21 days, and they were taking their flocks, their herds, their women and children through that very rugged territory. And if you just give them 10 miles a day, it would be roughly in the neighborhood of 210 days. We also know that whenever the Book of Mormon talks about going up and down, it's talking about elevations, not north and south. In fact, we don't even know how the, the Nephites and the Lamanites held their maps. We think they probably held them for, so the east was up because the east was a major direction for them. When Amalickiah, in his uh, Blitzkrieg of the East City, starting with Moroni and ending close to Bountiful, you get the impression that he took these cities day after day after day, or sometimes within days. In fact, between Mulek and Bountiful was less than a day because it, it, the Lamanites were chasing the Nephites until Tienka met them and forced them back down, back to Mulek, all in one day. And so... This distance is probably not more than 60 to 80, 100 miles at the very most. There are a couple of other areas. Over in the western area, where, not, where Alma went to teach some people of Malik and then up to Ammonihah, Ammonihah was only three days north of Malik. And then from Malek, then they went over to the land of Sidon. There's also an area down close to the narrow uh, strip of wilderness where there were four or five cities from Manti over to a city on the coast. Those cities were probably not more than 20 to 30 miles apart based on where the natural valleys are for the Lamanites to have come down to capture them. And so we're left with an area in the Book of Mormon of relatively small area uh, spaces such as in uh, Jerusalem. You know, the, the, the entire Bible takes place in the land of Jerusalem, which is even less in distance than it is here in Mesoamerica in the order of something not more than 600 miles north, probably even less than that. Well, that's actually all the way up to Camorra. And only about 140 to 150 to 180 miles from east to west. That's just a little bit bigger than the state of Utah. And so you can see that things were not all that extensive. Obviously, the, the Isthmus of Panama could not have been the narrow neck of land because uh, the, the, the distances just aren't there. Now, to look at a current map of Mesoamerica, we can see how much of these distances and it can be explained. There's a, narrow, there's a narrow strip of wilderness called the Cuchimatani and Santa Cruz Mountains that go from the East Sea to the West Sea, and that's mentioned also in the Book of Mormon. Most authorities feel that the Isthmus of Tehuantepec is the narrow neck of land. And th there is an area right from here about 40 miles where it's um, kind of a, a flat beach area with gradual sloping up to a mountain. 40 miles is about where a Nephite could walk in a day and a half. And then from here up to here is, are the mountains that uh, would be not be necessary to fortify between the land bountiful and the land desolation. <clears throat> I've always concerned uh, myself that this so-called narrow neck of land may have been a little bit too wide. I'm not sure that Mormon or Alma or Elaman could differentiate how narrow that is compared with 
uh, here or here. <clears throat> a few years ago, there were some articles in the paper that talked about the flooding of the state of Tabasco in Mexico. The state of Tabasco is a lowland area on the Gulf Coast, and it is uh, largely, it's just the farms and sugar canes and so forth, although there are some cities there. And uh, there were also mudslides that we can, we can relate to in the Book of Mormon. So I, I took that uh, information, plotted out on this map, and when the flooding occurs, which it does every year, somewhere between two and four feet of water extends the Gulf Coast, the Gulf of Mexico, clear up to where it's uh, a little bit higher elevation. And it does indeed take about 80% of the state of Tabasco, plus some of Veracruz and some of uh, Campeche. And so at this point, this is a narrow neck of land by anybody's estimation. And so now I feel a little bit better that uh, this, is a, this is indeed a narrow neck of land. Anywhere between four and five months of the year are flooded in that location. <clears throat> There's also a question about directions in the Book of Mormon. Uh, quite often the, the writers talk about the land north or northward, sometimes south or southward. They generally don't talk about east and west. They talk about the seas east and the seas west, but not, not the land. Now, a lot of early, you might say, primitive people, and even currently people who take their, lot by the, their directions by the sun, they, they look at the earth, uh, the location where they're sitting as if it was a circle. Now, if this is east to the right of us, at, uh, on September 21st and March 21st, the sun comes up right directly at this location, and it sets this way here. And then, of course, north from that is 90 degrees north and 90 degrees south. The Nephites knew their major cardinal directions, at least Nephi did, because he talked about going south, southeast along the Red Sea. But the people also gear their directions according to where the sun rises. Now, on November 5th, where does the sun rise? Does it, send, does it come over here? It comes somewhat south, doesn't it? In fact, it comes down as far south as this direction here. And so when the Nephite is looking at, on December 21st at the winter solstice, he's looking kind of southwest. And then, of course, it's, it's set southwest. And so, therefore, if this is east and this is west, everything north of that is north. And even in the, in the summertime on June 21st, when the sun is setting to the north and the sun is setting to, to, the, to the north and the west, still, whatever is north of that is north, and it's not just 90 degrees, it's 140 degrees. Now let's superimpose that map, I mean that uh, direction onto this map. See if you can, you can see that. If we place Zarahemla right about in the middle of the land southward, because it was in the central part of the land, on December 21st, when the sun rose here and it set here, everything to the north is north, even including what we would consider to be west. And even on June 21st, when the sun is a little bit higher in the sky, it still shows that north is actually more northwest than it is really north. And so, um, again, we're not concerned about having to shift directions in order to account for what appears to be north or northward in the Book of Mormon. Those of you who are not uh, completely familiar, there were a half a dozen books written by authors, some of whom are in the congregation today, that uh, probably you ought to be somewhat familiar with 
if you're going to study the lands of the Book of Mormon. John Sorensen uh, wrote this book, An Approach to the uh, Ancient America, setting for the Book of Mormon. He also wrote Mormon's Map. Both of these are still in print. Joe Allen, who originally wrote this, Exploring Lands of the Book of Mormon, has uh, this is out of print now, so he revised it with Ted Stoddard's help into this one. And this one even has a new cover. I, I haven't, uh, this is... Uh, this is the copy from a couple of years ago. He also wrote Sacred Sites, uh, which d detail much of his thinking and feeling and study of Book of Mormon events and locations. R Dr. Rick Houck is an archaeologist, and the reason he's not here today is because he's down in Central America doing archaeological research today. This book is out of print. You can get it through... Amazon and their used book department. It's a little technical, and, and we're waiting for him to update this book. Garth Norman has written a treatise on uh, his understanding of the Book of Mormon. He also includes a very nice uh, detailed map, which um, goes along with this book. John Sorensen has a or John Lund, excuse me, John, has a book called The Mesoamerica and the Book of Mormon, Is This the Place? And he, uh, this is one of the more recent books, in fact, probably the most recent of the major books, and he explains a lot of detail in there that uh, would be really well for us to know. And then Jerry Ainsworth, who will speak to us today, uh, has his book on the travels of Mormon and Moroni. Each of these uh, authors have listed numerous cities and places in the Book of Mormon, and then they go through and explain where these various cities were. Some of them are more uh, intact uh, than others, but they, but they all have uh, a quite similar interest. I realize you can't see this, but this is all on the presentation that's on the BMAF website. If you just go there and look under my name, and it's called Comparisons of the Book of Mormon. <clears throat> and this is another thing you can't see, but this is a list of all of the cities and locations that are found in the Book of Mormon that these authors have described. And this is a list of a bibliography that's also in the Book of Mormon. Now, the rest of the day today, we're going to be talking about the River Sidon. We know that the River Sidon begins in the narrow strip of wilderness. And then it flows downhill and northward and empties into, as we know now, the Gulf of Mexico goes through the greater land of Zarahemla. There are five cities that are mentioned in relation to the riverside. And the main city is the city of Zarahemla and also the local land of Zarahemla. It's in the capital parts, or in other words, the middle of the land southward, the middle of the Zarahemla, the greater land of Zarahemla. The city of Manti and the land of Manti are up near the headwaters of the River Sidon. And uh, the city of Manti is mentioned quite often. The city and the land of Gideon, we know, according to the Book of Mormon, is on the east side of the River Sidon, as opposed to Zarahemla, which is on the west side. We're not sure exactly where, if it's upstream or downstream, and, and how, close, how far or how close to the riverside it is. This, the land of Minan, uh, no city of Minan is mentioned, just the land, is uh, between Zarahemla and Manti. We, we think that it may be on the west side of the river because the travel between Zarahemla and Minan never mentions crossing the riverside. And then further north is the land called Sidom, S-I-D-O-M, and it's to this location 
that the converts from Ammonihah, which is about right here, went to after they were cast out, where Zeezrom was, was cast out and where he repented and was converted. <clears throat> the wilderness of, Surmounts is, of Hermounts is up in this direction and so forth. We have not mentioned any of the east cities or some of the other locations because they don't pertain to the river Sidon. Now, I don't know why that was so dark. There are four rivers in Mesoamerica. The Motagua River we can eliminate because it's an eastward flowing river and the entire river is in Lamanite territory where the Book of Mormon record keepers never knew. The Quetzalcoatlcos River is up here in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. It doesn't qualify because it doesn't begin in a in the narrow strip of wilderness and it doesn't go past very many cities and so forth. That leaves us with two rivers. The River Grijalva starts up, its headwaters are up in the land and in the narrow strip of wilderness. It flows kind of in a northwesterly direction. At the present time, this river has changed course and now joins the Usamacinta River close to the Gulf of Mexico. With all of that flooding that I mentioned, uh, the, ch the river has changed channels several times, but originally from about 2,000 years ago, it apparently had its own mouth to the about uh, 50 miles west of the river Usamacinta. This river goes through the Chiapas Basin and there are numerous uh, cities, ruins and so forth in that location. The other river is the Usamacinta which also starts about 10 miles away from the Grijalva up in the narrow strip of wilderness flows kind of eastward and then forms the border between Guatemala and Mexico, winds its way through the Peten lowlands and the grain forests of Chiapas and Campeche and empties into the Gulf of Mexico. One of these two rivers apparently is the River Sidon. Uh, why, why Alma and Mormon Nephi probably didn't ever know about it because uh, he, he was up in the land of Nephi. But Alma and Helaman, maybe Mosiah, and certainly Mormon would have known where the, uh, where the other river was, but for some reason they never mentioned it. And so we're left to determine which of these two rivers is the river Sidon. Now it's my testimony the Book of Mormon is true regardless of which river the the Sidon is, but we're going to now hear a discussion. We'll have two presentations on the River Grijalva, which is the first one, the westernmost river, excuse me. And then we'll have two more presentations on the Usamacinta River. And then we'll have a short break after that where we'll have these four participants plus Kirk Magleby and Joe Allen who will come up and field questions. <clears throat> Each of you have a pad of paper and a pen. If you would like to write down questions you have regarding the River Sidon or either of these two rivers, please keep it to that. Don't ask about anything except for the rivers because we won't have time for anything else. Please write them down during the next two pr four presentations. During the break before the panel discussion, we'll uh, collect them and then Richard Gordon, our president, We'll moderate the discussion with the panel participants. And that's what I have to say today. <clears throat> 